Okay, so uh, hello everybody. Welcome to another episode of uh, Bones and Stones. Today we are excited to have uh, Nandi uh, Masimula with us from UCT, who's currently a PhD student. We know Nandi from her WITS days. Uh, that's where we got to know each other. Nandi also came and joined us at a few of the uh, student development workshops as well. She was also quite involved there. So Nandi, it's great to uh, have you join us today. Thanks obviously for, for giving up your, your time to, to chat to us a little bit about your research. Um, and, and we've been chatting for the last few minutes about your work and it really seems like you are dealing with a very interesting um, topic at the moment, uh, you know, dealing with agricultural, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, handling agriculture in Eswatini and, and, and looking at how um, ind ind indigenous knowledge systems uh, play a role in crop cultivation and things like that. Also working with uh, isotopes as well. So it sounds like you've got a very kind of all encompassing project. So um, maybe if you could talk us through your, your research and what you've been doing uh, for the last while. All right, um, thanks for having me on your segment guys. Um, so my PhD project is based on sorghum crops that were grown in Eswatini, as you guys have already mentioned. Um, I'm working with a very helpful group of farmers, very generous. Um, they've been very generous with, um, with their knowledge and their time and as well as their resources, um, because um, they gave me two plots of land. And on those plots of land, uh, I, I managed to um, some plant sorghum, sorghum seeds. And I have to say, I have to mention it, that it's indigenous sorghum that I'm working on. Um, and then after that, after the harvesting period, I went back to Eswatini and um, I then ran carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis on, on the sorghum. And then because I wanted to try to see how I can incorporate indigenous knowledge systems into my project, um, I then went back to Eswatini to speak to the, to, to the group of farmers to basically understand um, the, the, the farming practices um, that are involved in, in, their, in their farming today, as well as to understand how farming practices were um, in the past. They could go as far back as, as, as they could. Um, yeah, just to try to understand the, the decision-making processes that are involved when a farmer decides what to plant, when to plant it, um, uh, and, and what kind of uh, other measures um, they should take in order to ensure some kind of um, like healthy yield at the end of the growing season. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. And, and also in your research, you spoke about um, creating a baseline in terms of how you can understand the crops and uh, is that where the kind of isotopes come in? Uh, could you maybe unpack the isotope signatures and, and the value that they're going to bring to the to the research? Sure. Um, so, so um, as we, we we know now that plants have got um, uh, variation in their isotope uh, values. Uh, so we know there's variation in plants, but we do not know the extent of the variation. And so that's very important because. Um, plants form the base of, of the food chain. Um, and so if I'm looking at the, the, the carbon isotope ratios of the plant, um, they, they have an effect on um, the consumer that eats the plant, mm. as well as the consumer that eats that consumer that eats the plant. You see where I'm getting at? Mm. So as you go up the food chain and you start to study the, the, the carbon and nitrogen isotope uh, ratios, for example, of that particular uh, consumer, it's very important to know, um, to understand why there is variation in, in uh, the plants where everything starts. So you need to understand, uh, you need to have a, a very good understanding of, of the ground level work first, so that when you're trying to explain things higher up in the food chain, you know where it comes from, because they all influence each other as you go up the food chain. Um, now, the problem is here in, in, in Southern Africa, we do not have a, 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 an, an isotope uh, ratio or an isotope signature baseline for crops that were grown in Southern Africa, let's say in the Iron Age period, for example. Um, and so when we try to have discussions or, um, that have to do with dietary behavior of uh, Iron Age farming communities, uh, we are lacking that database um, to work from. So that's where now my project comes in when it comes to the carbon and nitrogen isotope aspect of it. Uh, I'm just trying to address those issues, yeah. Jeez, okay, no, that's incredibly interesting. Thanks, Nani. I'm gonna hand over to Matt though. He's got a question for you. Yeah, okay. thanks very much, Nani. This is super, super interesting topic. Uh, so two questions for you. 
uh, kudos to you for growing your own sorghum. Uh, how difficult was that? Um, did you have to sort of like travel back and forth to check on your crops or did the, did the farmers help you out there? And, and number two, um, uh, you know, I think the really fascinating part about your project is incorporation of uh, um, indigenous knowledge systems. Um, so maybe if you could just touch upon that, you know, sort of like how you um, developed that information, you know, were you speaking to, to, the, to the local farmers, local communities? Um, how, did that, how did that process work? So to answer your first question, um, so I had, to, I had to go back and forth um, from, from Cape Town to, to Eswatini. Uh, the first meeting was to just establish some kind of relationship with the farmers. Um, and then after that, then I had to um, work together with uh, some, um, there's a research station in Eswatini called the Malkins Research Station. And there they keep all the, it's like a, a seed bank for a lot of the crops that are grown there. Um, so I had to establish a relationship with them as well to be able to gain access to, um, to, the, to the seeds, to the sorghum seeds. Um, and so I did that. And then I went back to Eswatini and I was given the, the two plots of land. So both locations are in the low felt in Eswatini, but the locations are, are, are separate. And so they helped me, you know, all the steps um, that had to be taken um, during the, the, the sowing process. Um, they right. helped me through that, the, the, the farmers themselves. Um, and then once that was done, I came back to, to South Africa and um, basically nature took its course. Um, there wasn't anything that they needed to do. Um, uh, we, the only thing that we needed to do was to wait, because I remember that year, it was 20, 20, 2017. Uh, we had to wait uh, a bit longer for the first rains to, 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 to start. Um, normally the, 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 the sowing period starts in September or August, uh, but sometimes they need to push it a little further if there aren't any rains. Right. So after that, then uh, about three or four months later, uh, I went back. Now, the thing is with, um, with uh, Swati people is that they have a, a thing where after, after um, when harvesting is about to happen, uh, they need like permission from the king first. So they need to do these kind of celebrations of the first harvests. And then afterwards, um, you can um, start uh, harvesting. Right. Um, like everyone else can now start harvesting. So I waited for that period and then I went um, to Eswatini and I, I got the crops and then came back with them this side and then did the, the, the analysis, the, the carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis on them. Thanks. Wow, super, super fascinating. Um, and, and, then, sorry, and then also your, um, your sort of development of this Indigenous knowledge system, your interaction with it. Uh, what what was that like? Where you you said you've uh, you've done quite a bit of interviews and you're having um, some work done with that now. Can can you maybe just uh, touch upon that side of your research as well? Sure. Um, so I, there was a separate uh, field trip for that. I went back to the to the farmers. I spoke to a larger group of farmers because you know you want to get as much information as as possible. Um, and what I was trying to to do was to understand their farming practices today and uh, also that of the past because so 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 what i did was um what i was trying to understand was what kind of what kind of decision making processes are influencing the way you you plant your sorghum like what kind of soils to choose that sort of you know i was asking those sort of questions um why because i was trying to sort of see how i can make a connection between the isotope part of uh, the project and the indigenous part of the project how I make sense of it is that when I'm looking at the carbon and nitrogen isotope uh, results, um, the, 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 those results can tell me something about the environmental conditions, for example, right? right. right. On the other end, when I'm looking at the indigenous knowledge systems, if you think about it, uh, people have to have a very good working knowledge of their environment as well. So they need yeah. to know a lot of um, uh, what kind of conditions are uh, conducive for growing what kind of, uh, of crops, what kind of soils do I need, what's the soil structure, what water, uh, how much water is needed, what nutrients do we need to add into the, into the soil, those kind of things. So then this now creates a bridge um, between uh, your carbon and nitrogen isotope analyses as well as your, 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 your indigenous knowledge systems. So that's how I'm trying to make sense of it myself. Uh, it'll only become clear now how 
uh, I will I will go about using that information once I have um, the the interviews back, and then once I've made sense of the the the, the isotope results. Wow, fascinating. Thanks, Thanks Nandi. Yeah, that's, that's, um, it's, it's incredibly interesting how you're kind of integrating the, the two data sets. Just uh, purely from a landscape perspective, it's so interesting. Um, uh, presumably, the farmers also, like you say, they've got to control a number of different variables when they are uh, managing the crops. Uh, also rotating through different cropping areas throughout the different years as well, um, because presumably soil chemistry is a very important thing. So, you know, ma then maintaining aspects like erosion and stuff as well, and as you said, how much water to add. It really is incredibly interesting how these communities um, have to understand the landscape uh, in such detail so that they can obviously promote the uh, the yields of the, the vegetation and the crops and stuff. Um, but then just to look a little bit more broadly about, you know, the interaction between, um, you know, kind of Western style science and in indigenous knowledge systems and, and, and how important it is to kind of integrate these two data sets where you can. Um, Matt and myself, we do Stone Age archaeology, so sometimes it's a little bit difficult for us to incorporate indigenous knowledge systems into our research, not to say that it's not something we shouldn't consider, it definitely is. Um, just in, sorry, as an aside, uh, I read it in the news this week, um, Dr. Bladen Zamande is, is uh, looking at how indig indigenous knowledge systems and, and knowledge of uh, traditional medicines could possibly help um, look for treatments when it comes to COVID. And I mean, this is looking at tried and tested um, uh, medicinal plants where there's factual evidence showing the benefit of these plants to treat respiratory diseases and things like that. Um, and, and it just shows you how, um, you know, indigenous knowledge in that respect can then help uh, fight a pandemic uh, such as a, sorry, I know COVID is probably the last thing we want to hear about at the, at the moment. But um, I just thought it was quite fitting that we were talking about integrating data sets this week with you or today and uh, I was reading about that in the in the news the last day or so ago. Yeah, um, definitely. That's the reason why for me Indigenous Knowledge Systems uh, is so appealing because it's very broad um, and uh, it's, it's, it's ever-changing. Um, not to say that Western Knowledge Systems on its own uh, is is not enough to come up with uh, certain solutions that or certain yeah to come up with certain solutions to the problems that we are facing but imagine now including or incorporating uh, indigenous knowledge systems which i in my opinion it's the oldest or one of the oldest um, knowledge bases that we have mm. a lot of the a lot of the disciplines that um, that we are involved in are they actually take take from indigenous knowledge systems, mm. for example, like medicine. Mm. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's high time that we, we start having conversations that include indigenous knowledge systems and uh, the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, in, uh, help that it can, it can add to, 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 to our research and the kind of questions that we ask and the kind of discussions that we have as, as academics. And um, yeah, it shows that indigenous knowledge systems is, it's, uh, you can you can apply it in many many different fields yeah and it's it's there it's there it has to be used exactly yeah just just talking from both of our experience matt and i we've recently been doing some some research in, in the northern cape um and with the project that we were working on as well it was very much a, a landscape based project and we were also able to to a degree incorporate some indigenous knowledge from ethnography as well and look at how it was a very in-depth understanding of the natural landscape so uh, just recently you know having had the opportunity to work on such a great project like that um as you say it, it, you know indigenous knowledge is out there and if we can plug into it um you know it gives us such a more holistic understanding of the archaeological archaeological landscapes that we're trying to investigate so it's obviously incredibly uh, incredibly valuable but nandi i think we're coming yeah. up on time now so i think we're gonna we're yeah. gonna call it there sorry I, I should have said at the beginning beginning uh, for all our viewers that tim is unfortunately not able to join us today due to some escom uh, load shedding issues so hopefully he will be with us the next time so it was just matt and myself running the show today but nandi thanks very much for your time today we really do appreciate thank that. you you know, uh, you chatting with us, and, and it was great hearing about your research and stuff. We look forward to seeing the seeing the results and the final product uh, when you eventually wrap it up. Yeah, thank you very much um, for having me, guys.